in my life, in my work. Um, the SATAA is the South African TA Association. Um, and the Professional Standards Standard Committee is part of my pro bono work in the um, training and certification standards of the International TA Association. So um, very exciting times at the moment where we are looking at the world in 2021 and really being making quite radical changes in how we train and certify transactional analysts in all four um, specializations of TA, which is psychotherapy, counseling, organizational development, and um, learning, um, educating. Uh, so really excited to be making it more accessible to people in different places of the world, rather than just people who can afford to travel to a conference um, to do their exam. We're doing lots of virtual work and also taking into account grassroots people, people who learn differently, how can they show up in the best way possible rather than in just one way with a written thesis and a live exam. So that's very exciting work that is part of my pro bono work. I'm really delighted to see that some of you know quite a bit of TA, others not very much. Um, and I hope that I will be meeting all of you where you are. Um, I've got a sense as well of where you're coming from. Gosh, there's some names that I know. There's someone in my TA training group. I'm so delighted that you're here too. Someone who was training with me a few years ago and so many new people as well. So really looking forward to these two hours or so. Um, what I will be doing, what we will be doing is I'm going to share the ICF competencies that really, for me, are brought alive by TA. Um, when you think of coaching, it's about inner and outer change. And then I'm going to share one TA framework that talks about our outer way of being in the world and one that talks about our inner way of being in the world and overlay them. And for me, when, we, when those two models hold hands, it really informs a lot of who I am in my work, how I work with my coaching clients, my supervisees, my trainees, and also how coaches can be using the psychological mindedness of TA to make sense of your own, own work. And I think with any learning worth its salt, the invitation is put yourselves center stage first and go, wow, what am I learning about me through this model? And then go, oh, now I get it about me. How can I use it with my clients? I think you will miss out if you just keep it at a distance and think you can use it with clients. Um, my trainer always said to me, you can't do TA to people. You've got to really understand it for yourself and then do it in a very respectful contracting way. So what is TA? I'm going to jump straight in. I'll pause every now and then for comments in the plenary and there will be at least three small group um, moments where you can talk in more detail. So Eric Byrne, I see someone read or has said they saw games people play, not that they'd read it, but started by Eric Byrne. Um, the, those are his dates. You can see he didn't live to be a very old person. And gosh, so many of us today say, I wonder what Byrne would have said if he'd lived for longer. In its essence, it's a theory of human development, personality and communication. And it's got two parts. The first part that I put in green is what we talk about is intracyclic. So that's what's going on in my head. Um, TA talks about our script or our narrative. Um, what meaning making am I making about myself, others, and the world? So that's our inner world. And I'm sure those of you who are coaches can already start to see, aha, there's a link with coaching here in a framework to help us make sense of the meaning people are making of their themselves. And then TA's got models about the interpersonal dynamic. So these are two people, a team of people. How do we show up in our interactions with others? And by combining the two, for me, it's my psychological thinking framework in all of my work. 
So I think you'll agree with me. I'm using the ICF framework because that's what I'm um, immersed in. Uh, if you have a different framework, I'm sure it, it, you can do the, the shifting. But coaching is really at the heart of it, inviting new meaning. And I see it as that people come with external goals, but there's also got to be an internal shift. Otherwise, they could have just achieved their external goal. So starting with the internal shifts, here are some of the ICF competencies. And I've uh, the docs say that I've just taken out some words in some of them instead of writing the whole of them. But for example, 4.1 seeks to understand the client within the context, their context, which may include identity, environment, experiences, values, and beliefs. So there's the inner world. Who do I think I am? What do I believe about me in my context? Um, here's one of the, um, the competency 6.1. It names it again, considers the client's context, experiences, beliefs. When we get into um, evoking awareness, 7.3 says asks questions such as the client's way of thinking, their values, their needs, their wants and beliefs. And later on, it helps client identify factors that influence current and future patterns of behavior, thinking or emotion. So you can see there's quite a lot about beliefs, values, wants, needs. These, this is the inner world of our clients. And I think as coaches, we are asked to have a way of listening and inviting change in that internal landscape of our clients. But it doesn't stop there, as we all know. It's also about what are those external goals? And just to link some competencies to that, um, the grounding, the learning um, competencies of eight works to integrate new awareness, insight or learning into the world, you and behaviors and partners to design goals, actions, accountability measures that integrate and expand new learning. So at the heart of coaching, it's learning, it's understanding the internal world and making changes. And it's then becoming action and there's how do they show up in the world? So TA for me, if I take two of the frameworks out of, gosh, 12 or 15 frameworks in the whole of TA, um, I think two models go together beautifully to look at the outer work in communication styles and then the internal dynamics when we look at psychological games and the drama triangle. And these are the two we're gonna be playing with today. Um, gosh, we're all around the world. I was gonna say this evening, but I know the time zones are, is such a wide range. So whatever your time of day is. Um, so communication st styles, briefly, it's what we notice and experience in ourselves and our clients. And it's to start noticing what is the pattern of communication that our clients are using. And they're doing this usually unconsciously. They don't realize that there's a pattern there that's not that useful. And learning the TA model, they go, oh, wow, that's why some of it doesn't work well. And here are some options. So they start to be able to say, ha, huh, this style of communication really works and the other one doesn't. And then when we look at that internal world of our clients, um, it's that meaning making or script. Um, and why are we doing um, this? We have ways of supporting the meaning making. And all of us, as we grew up, have inevitably got some limiting beliefs about ourselves and others and what the world is. And when people come for any work of learning, change, development, coaching, they're really saying, I want to rewrite my script now. I want to edit it. I want to start making a bit new, uh, some new meaning about who I am in the world. Um, and then what do we do if without awareness, we, we get to play psychological games, one of the fundamental models of TA. And the drama triangle can really give us good insight into what are clients doing that unconsciously supports their limiting beliefs. And then each of these has got a positive alternative. I'm going to come back to the whole group for a few moments before we jump into the, the communication model. 
to see where you are. Um, we, we, we're doing really well with the time. So a question or two. Um, Claire, if you'll help me just catch the questions if people wave your hand or, or, or put up your hand. Sure. Anything so far that you would like more clarification on before we actually jump in? So there's nothing in the chat in terms of questions, but do take yourself off mute or wave your hand and we can get them answered. Everything's clear. Well, that's nice, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> so let's get into the first model. Um, I'm going to uh, optimize for a video clip because I've got two short clips that I want to use as well. Right, here we go. So the first model of TA is often what people say, oh, you do that TA, it's that parent adult child stuff. Um, and they sort of roll their eyes and go, mm, yeah, okay. And that is one of the basic models of TA indeed. Um, and a colleague, of, uh, a South African colleague and myself wrote an article in the journal in 2014 that added an, a really interesting piece to the model. So to fill you in, TA says that we have a parent, an adult and a child ego state. The diagram you see on the left, it's a way of almost saying that's a filing system of all our experiences from when we were born until how we are today sitting in this webinar, we are in our child taking in how it feels, what our in, internal experience is of our life, of this webinar. In our parent ego state, we've got filed all the copies of people who were in um, positions of authority over us. Um, and in our adult ego state, we, we're interacting in the moment with the here and now. Then the second model of, of ego state is saying there's actually also an external pattern of communication where you can see now their positive and negative modes um, and a box. And I'm going to unpack this for you bit by bit. And this is the really useful part for us to realize how do we show up in the world in our conversations with our clients? How are our clients showing up? in their roles as leaders and managers with their teams, which of these ego state modes are they mostly playing in, as it were? So let's begin. The negatives and the positives are shorthand for saying the negative modes are indicating that somebody's not okay, either me or the other person in my inner sense of how I'm relating to them, the positive modes are the respectful modes. I'm okay, you're okay, which is another TA model. So in our parent ego state at the top, there's a positive, useful, respectful way of showing our nurturing mode. So we know this as biological parents, little people. I've got a three-year-old grandchild. He knows how to look after me and says, Granny, are you okay? That's his nurturing parent. Um, really old people in their 90s can, can be caring and nurturing. So the name parent doesn't mean biological parent. It's a, it's a way of us thinking about how we relate in the world. But sometimes the nurturing can be overdone, hence the negative mode, because it's disrespecting somebody in the relationship. And this is called the marshmallowing mode. This is when we help too much, overprotective. So put on your coaching hat. Do you sometimes feel sorry for your clients and you try and help them and you give them advice and sometimes that doesn't go so well? So keep that in mind as you think of you in your coaching role or your leadership role, whatever your role is. The other dynamic in the parent mode is that style of communicating that we've called the dominating mode. That's the the critical, the judging, the over-controlling, the punishing, um, telling somebody off, deciding for people what they must do. It's you just do that because it's right and I know it's right. Don't question me. It's that sort of flavor. 
but that's being in charge in um, on this side of the middle line is not all bad. If we do it in a respectful way, it's very, very important. And that's called the structuring mode, where there's got to be structure, there's got to be a negotiated contract. It's really appropriate to be assertive, um, consistent, reliable. If I'm thinking with my coach supervisor hat on, there are times when we're supervising clients where there would be ethical dilemmas or um, maybe issues of burnout. And we really need to use that positive structuring parent to be assertive and say, stop, this work is not right. You are breaking boundaries here. You're, you're, you're working unethically. But we don't do it in a judgmental way. We do it with present-centered awareness in a respectful way. So we've got four choices when we're in our parent ego state, which is really when we're caring for people or in charge in some way. Now let's look what happens in the child ego state. This is our inner world, if you like, and how does this show up? So what in the original models, for those who know some TA was the natural child, the positive mode is called the spontaneous mode. This is where we're curious, creative, there's genuine feelings. This is that what you see is what you get. There's no hidden agendas. We're just warm, friendly, um, angry if we need to be, but angry in a way that is respectful, not that um, judges and um, distances the other person. So it's being really in touch with our authentic feelings. Um, certainly as coaches, those curious questions, we've got to have some of our spontaneous child coming to the party there. But sometimes we can overdo that, and that's called the immature mode. So this is very much when we're egocentric, uh, selfish, overimpulsive. So maybe when we, when we tell jokes too often or we, we, we try and be all chummy with our coaching clients, um, or tell them how good we are at something, mm, that's not really useful. It's more about me than the person I'm relating to. So you'll see that's got a negative mode. It's usually when we're feeling insecure, we've got to try and boost our ego by telling people how wonderful we are. On the other side, this was the adapted child. And there are when that's done in a disrespectful way, we either are compliance, or resistance. So we get anxious, withdrawn, submissive. This is where maybe as a coach, we go, oh, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I'm not really, this client isn't seeming to get any ahas. Oh, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be coaching this client. Or some of us have learned when we're little to just be resistant and we push back and we're, we're rebellious. So we 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 say, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Why should I? It's that sort of language that will go with it. But at times in our adaptive child, we have to be collaborating, considerate, adaptable. And that's a respectful way of, this is what we're about, let's cooperate now. So that's also got a positive mode, um, positive sign. And then the last bit in the middle is the adult. And this is called the accounting mode. It's taking accounts of what's going on with you, with me, with the system, what's the contract, what's happening right now in the work we're doing. And the adult is really the only ego state that's present right now. TA has this phrase that says, talks about the here and now. And the bit that I added to this model is this, what's lovingly being called the, well, it's in the journal as well, the okay, okay box, which is saying, if we can dance in this box, we are responding with present-centered awareness. It's respectful of ourselves and others and the system. And really, we get very good work done. But if we jump outside the box to one of the negative parents or the negative child modes, it's more about reacting. We've gone into the past. We might be sitting here as a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old. But our way of being with our clients, with our family, if you want to talk, to talk personally for a bit, is more about what we did when we were a three-year-old or a six-year-old to get our needs met. 
So we've rubber banded way back to that subtleness of when we were a little kid. We've stopped being in touch with who we are in the moment. So you can get a sense that with two people, coach and client, supervisor, supervisee, whoever you're in relationship with, if one person is responding from the box, it's going to invite the other person to respond from the box. And it's both are in the, the TA term for this box is the integrating adults. So it's if, if I'm, I'm going to use it in this form, just so I can play with my cursor, it's if with adults awareness, we integrating that positive two side, positive bits of parent, the positive bits of child. And it's like we are, I want to go back to this full picture. It's like we're dancing with hula hoops. Um, when I do train face-to-face, -face, I do put three hula hoops on the floor um, and they wide hula hoops because they come from India. I've traveled a lot and trained in India and they beautiful crenated hula hoops. Maybe the people in India know what I'm talking about. They're big. So with my left foot in the adult, I can dip my toe into right in this millisecond now in my conversation with my client. Do I need to be assertive and structuring? Do I need to be nurturing? Do I need to be curious? Do I need to be cooperative? One foot staying firmly grounded in the here and now in the adult. The other toe is dipping in. So it's like I'm adding flavor to my adult ego state from the positive parts of the parent or the child. But if you saw me trying to do that uh, big stride with my Indian hula hoops, to put a foot in here, I can't keep my foot in the adults. So metaphorically, I've lost touch with current reality when I get into being critical, when I'm trying to help too much, when I'm being egocentric or when I'm being anxious or rebellious. So any of the reacting modes are not useful because I've lost touch. The richness of our wholesome interactions are in the OK, OK box. So if you're working with a client and one of you, doesn't matter which way it starts, one of you goes outside the box to a negative parent, inevitably you can invite a negative child mode in response. So if I'm coaching and I go, oh, okay, so you said you were going to do these things, but I noticed you haven't done this again with quite a critical judging voice from my critical dominating parent, my client's probably going to go into, oh, yes, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. Or they're going to go, well, of course, you know, how do you judge me like that? And they'll push back from um, a rebellious child. Let me stop for a moment for any questions. About Look, first of all, this is absolutely fabulous. And um, you're explaining it so clearly. Karen, we've got one question so far from Britta. And the question is, sounds like it is connecting to overusing of strengths that turn into inner saboteur. How does that land? The Your sound's not on at the moment for some reason. I know you're not on mute, Karen, but for some reason we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Okay. Am I back now? Perfect. Sorry. It had a wobble. The original version of our script we created when we were little people growing up and it's inevitably got the, I'm not good enough. I'm not, not like the family next door. I'm not good at school. So they often, a lot of weaknesses are there and we try and compensate in our outward life by being too judgmental because that's the way we learn. If you're a, a, a little child, you can stay safe in this family if you're the bully in the family or you'll stay safe in the family if you just shut up and keep quiet and don't, don't say too much. But I think that's an interesting question. If our strengths are then overdone, they could well also go into those negative modes. Thank you for that. Was that Britta, your question? Yeah. 
Thank you. And we've got another one here from uh, Isabel. Thank you, Isabel. The idea is to dance with the client always with one foot in the adult hula hoop and the other foot in the okay, okay, right? So that's the question. So, um, let me just go back to that picture to share the screen, come back, where are you? That picture. So my, my metaphor of dancing is one foot in the adults, ego state, also known as hula hoop, if you're having fun on a floor, and the other foot is in one of the positive modes. And when you're playing like that, you're gonna invite your clients to also bring themselves into present-centered awareness. Maybe this slide shows it better. So when you get out of the box here to be critical, or you trying to help them too much, you, you, your foot isn't in the adult anymore, metaphorically. You've lost touch with adult um, here and now reality. And then it's reaction, and you're getting into, oh, I'm only okay if I'm the helpful kid in, the in my family, so I better be the helpful coach and I better give advice to my clients, for example, from this um, marshmallowing parent place. Is that making sense? To, for that, the person who asked the second question. And Isabel said, okay, it's clear. Oh, okay. And there's um, one other comment, sorry, it says international number, so they may be dialing in. That question appears to link TA with SDI, Strengths Development Inventory. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, it's not a question, it's a comment. It's a comment. Oh, absolutely. It's appreciative wait. inquiry, strengths development, um, positive psychology, um, solution focused work are really narrative coaching. They really saying the same thing, which is what makes it so exciting for me that, hey, different people have seen the truth, if there's such a thing as truth, but they've seen something really essential in how humans um, work, that they um, just writing about it in, in different ways. So for a bit of light relief, I want to play you a three minute clip that I've found. And consider now how this little girl speaks about the relationship she's seeing between her mom and dad. And hold in mind the framework here of high and low, you know, low in the box and high is kind of quite, quite angry. Enjoy this. I think she's such a cute little thing. No one else than me. Mom, are you ready to be his friend? Yes. Try not to be that, that high up to be friends. I want everything to be low, okay? Okay. Just try your best. I, I don't want you and my dad to be replaced and, and me again. I want you and my dad to be placed and settled and be friends. I'm not trying to be mean. I just want everyone to be friends. And if I can be nice, I think all of us can be nice too. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to do my best in my heart. Hmm. Nothing else than that. I want you, mom, my dad, everyone to be friends. I want everyone to be smiling. I don't like being mad. I want everything to smile. Especially when I see someone, I want them to smile. Especially Nana, everyone. I want everyone to smile. And if that's for my dad and you, Mom, I think you can do it. I think you can settle your, your, mean, your mean heights down a little to short heights. Then it's both, okay? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be a bully. I'm trying to be steady on the floor, not way down, on straight, on the middle where my heart is. My heart 
it's something. Everyone else's heart is something too. And if we live in a world where everyone's being mean, everyone's going to be a monster in their future. What if, if there's just a little bit of person and we will eat them, then no one will ever be here. Only the monsters in our place. We need everyone to be a person. Everyone, including me and my mom, everyone. I just want everything to be settled down. Nothing else. I just want everything to be good as possible. Nothing else. Thank you, Tiana. So isn't that beautiful, her terminology? I wanted to be in the... Not low, just in the middle. Karen, you're going in and out okay. a little bit. Do you want to take your video off? Uh, just because we're losing bits. Ah, okay. Because we can still see your screen then. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Um, I, I'm, we can, yeah. Won't, I'm inviting people to take a screenshot of this if it's new for you, so that you can take this visual with you into the breakout rooms. So I'll give you a moment to do that before I share what the exercise will be. And in your small groups, if you think of yourself now as are you pretty much doing quite a lot of structuring? 10? Do you sometimes do the negative mode? Was that very little? Is that only a five? Are they equal five and five? So rate yourself just quickly in each of the modes and then get a feel. Where do you hang out in this model? Is it mostly dancing in the OK, OK box? Or do you sometimes step out there? Um, and what is it that invites you to step out of the box? What helps you stay in the box? So just start to bring yourself into this, this model and see uh, how you go. I'm looking at my time and if we take a uh, 10 minutes, Claire, in sure. groups four, and then we'll have time to come back and, and you can ask questions, share what you've noticed, etc. Sure. Okay, enjoy. Thank you. Just check there's someone in every room. Some people may be driving or sure. walking I, and they may not join. It might and not be possible. That's I'll fine. stop the recording, but Karen. Uh. Sharon, um, I don't know if I've spelt your surname correctly, and I keep staring at it. I'm dyslexic, though, so sometimes I spell things right, and then I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, you have it right. It's fountain, as in water fountain. Oh, I'm pleased about that. <laughs> in, in, in France, before my husband's family migrated, it was de la Fontaine, but th that's a uh -huh. long word. That sounds so... 
<laughs> it sounds very yeah. elegant, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back and back to Karen. Thank you. Um, we've got 10 minutes for questions, uh, insights, whatever you want to share. We'll take a five minute break after that, a bit of a wriggle, stretch, comfort break. And then we'll move into looking at the drama triangle, the winner circle, and then put them all together. So over to you. Um, please just unmute and speak or raise your hand. Or if you do want to type, Claire, I, I'm sure you'll be good at catching the questions. But I really enjoy engaging with you. So speak out if you would like to add or ask anything. So I have a question. So sure. I know being in the here and now is, you know, the best way for us to be when we're grounded in adult um, or the spontaneous and the structured nurturing and so forth. And when we waver and our lid goes down and we go into the outer extremes going um, into the negatives, any top tips to sort of bring ourselves back? Yeah, I mean, what a good question. Um, I think it's going to be unique for each of us. And often it's what, what is our, what other practices do we use in our life that keep us grounded, mindful, present? So is it going for a walk? Is it meditating? Is it breathing? Um, I love um, singing, I sing in a few, I used to sing before COVID and we're slowly picking up in a few um, sort of classical music, early Baroque music choirs. And when I'm singing a four part, six part ancient piece of music, I'm just completely in the moment. And that's what the adult is. When I'm engaging with my little three-year-old grandson, he just keeps me in the moment. I was with him today and I had put out of my mind completely that I was going to be working with all of you tonight because the creative, imaginative, allowing myself to be exactly with him and having yeah. fun together. So whatever it is for you, yoga, a walk. So it's not only psychologically, how can I be in the now? It, it's, it's as a whole human being, what are those practices? And I think certainly for me also um, supervision in my TA training and my supervisor training has always been a really big part. And so taking time to reflect on who am I in my work helps me to realize, hey, I stepped out of the box at that point. What was it that pulled me out? And what's the piece of work I need to do to maybe clear out some of those old script patterns that keep hijacking me so I think some psychological work but also practices body practices mindfulness spiritual practices as well thanks for that question anybody else I've got um, a kind of question thank you um, for the presentation and um, we were just as we were closing our really interesting um breakout um there was a talk of how sometimes in the marshmallowing space we might have an unspoken expectation of return so if you're you know really protecting and indulging and helping you might have an unspoken expectation you might have something given back and and if you don't I, but after the group, the group closed, I started looking at this screenshot and wondering whether one could have a feedback loop to the compliant resistant place. Brilliant, Emma. Your thinking is spot on. And that's exactly where we will go after our short break to look at the drama triangle. Because, yeah, you will go into that poor me. I'm not getting the feedback I want. And then the third part on the drama triangle is then I've got to blame that person because I was so giving and now you didn't give me the feedback. So it's all your fault. Um, so we, we, the, the negative feedback is in all of the out of the box, that marshmallowing parent, that compliant child, and then that 
dominating parent. Brilliant thinking. Yeah. Thank you. And, and there's a question. Sorry, yeah, Karen. Go, go for it. No, no, you go for it, Claire. Afia has asked, um, what could be possible? What could be the possible impact if I am able to be in the box? Wow. For, I mean, the, this is, how would we just call it? This is being, for me, it's really connecting with my deep humanness and another person's deep humanness. It's being, it's being present, it's being authentic. Um, for me, it brings deep joy. It, um, and things change because when we, we can't ever drag someone into that box kicking and screaming. We can't make somebody be there. We can invite them there. So the more humans on the, in, on the planet that can be present and authentic with empathy and compassion will invite others to join them there. This is might feel sound very idealistic, but I really believe that the more we are authentically ourselves, and that's what that in the present moment, the more it spreads to others. We could probably do a whole day talking about that as a group. I'm sure you've all got your own ways of, of naming it. And, and Afia says, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you all touch that at various moments in your work. You, this isn't weird. It, we, we do this. And I think TA for me has given me a framework to go, oh, now I know why it feels so profound in my connection, because I'm in the box or and I'm some of the other TA frameworks I would hold in mind. And then when it feels like something's going on here, I go, oh, now I know why it's not working as well as it might do, because I've stepped out of the box if we just stay with this model. And Morella, you've got your hand up. I'm sorry if yeah. your name's not pronounced correctly there. No, it's, it's you did it. You did an absolutely fabulous job. So the question that I have is, um, I know being out of the box doesn't serve us well, mm. but but I'm sure these scripts uh, are, you know, we 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 rely on these scripts for some reason, right? They, yes. they have to be supporting us in some way. So I'm just yes. wondering what what help or what support they might be providing. Why do we stick onto these scripts? How interesting, Murali. Yes, you, you're so right. It's TA talks about we get a payoff, we get our needs met. And but the thing about sticking to our scripts is they inevitably are outdated. It's what we learned to do when we were a little kid. The only way to, to get mommy to notice me is to be very quiet or very noisy or whatever our version is, or be very helpful or just be quiet. And then that worked for us to stay safe, but it then it's almost like we don't update our operating system as we learn and grow. And sooner or later, there's more negative payoffs that we no longer want. Um, but you might know um, another framework, it's not from TA called immunity to change. It's saying we want to give up one thing and change it, but then we feel we're gonna be, be betraying another uh, big assumption or that core belief. It, it dovetails very beautifully with TA. So I think sometimes we've got to go, oh, by changing one thing, let me also look at the other big assumptions. Are they still true? Which ones must I change? Which ones are actually working for me? And I can keep them. And I think that's why coaching is never a one conversation, aha, it's changed. Because we people have got a lifetime of beliefs that are all intermeshed as they were. And to, so to almost start unpicking them and saying, hey, these ones are good, maybe those ones. I often say to clients, let them go gently with gratitude because they served you well once upon a time. Don't push them away because what we push away is, you know, it's all that shadow stuff. It, it just comes back. So let them go gently and see what new permissions. TA speaks a lot about permissions. It's okay to speak out if as a kid we were told just know your place and keep quiet it's okay to choose to speak out 
uh, and then we start trying it out and, and, and writing a new. TA talks now about a, um, a positive life um, plan rather than a negative life script uh, in the developmental wings of, of TA. Shall we take a few minutes wriggle room, five minutes, and then come back to look at the second model? Okay. Yep, perfect. So here in um, Qatar, it's one minute past seven. What if we come back at, if you're on the hour, because I know some countries aren't, uh, five minutes time, so six minutes past. Cool. See you then.
Hi, everyone. We're, I'm about to jump into the next piece. If you're there, it would be lovely to see a few faces. Shall we go ahead, Claire? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Good contracting. Five minutes or five minutes. Right, so now we've looked at the a TA framework of ego states in this OK, OK communication style as a way of looking at this is the internal dynamics that we show up within and our clients as well in their styles of communication. We're now going to move to what's the inner world that often drives what the external communication is. And TA, as, as you know, uh, one of its early books in 1964, Byrne wrote the book called Games People Play. And it was quite a tongue-in-cheek, um, became a bestseller. And he'd certainly written another much more scholarly work earlier than that. Um, but this is what people kind of say, oh, yes, TA, it's, the, it's games, um, the games we play. And he used this word, and this is how it happens. There's a person and there's another person. And there's something going on on the obvious social level. So the words say one thing, but the, um, the tone is suggesting that there's something going on on that hidden psychological level. So I'll say, thank you for doing that for me again. So those words might be quite, thank you for doing that for me again. But my tone was... Thank you for doing that for me again. And there's a history there of why do you interfere or whatever the story is. So, and why do we do, why do we play games? It's our way of having our beliefs about ourselves and others and the world reinforced. So the script, the, the beliefs we hold, we can prove it. You, you see, nobody loves me. I try to help and this is what they do. Um, everyone always thinks I can't think for myself, whatever our theme is of our story. And this is the kind of, we know we've got into a game when we land up feeling bad. And the sense is it always turns out like this. Well, I, I tried so hard to be nice and now she still doesn't think I'm doing it right or whatever it is. And a brilliant way of analyzing games is to look at the drama triangle. So this was one of Byrne's contemporaries, Steve Kaufman, and he's still um, around and about at TA conferences and still writing lots of material. Um, many people have used this drama triangle. They call it different names. Um, it's just so useful. This is how he described it. He's saying, Sometimes we get into a role that's the rescuer role with a capital R. So this is not a, a real a role of um, ambulance service rescuing. This is a psychological um, way of being with others. So we think for them. We, we feel too responsible. We, in fact, minimize the other person's power. And we take too much responsibility. Um, this sort of person has probably got very poor boundaries and they can't say no. So this would be the sort of coach who comes for supervision and says, well, of course, my sessions, you know, we contract for an hour, but we're just getting to the important work. So we always take an hour and a half, but I can't really stop. And then they and then they call me in between and I've got it. I've got to just help them because they they're doing such good work. So can you see, and I'm, I'm maybe over-exaggerating, but just to make the point of actually doing too much for the other person. And a rescuer can only do their rescuing if there's a victim with a capital V. So this is the poor me person. They go, oh, it's so hard. They feel helpless. I can't do it. People like me couldn't do this. I haven't got enough resources. And they're just looking for someone like, please help me is their theme, if you like. And they're either going to look for a rescuer to do it all for them, which just confirms their belief of uselessness, or they're looking for the third role on the drama triangle, that persecutor. Um, 
in in sometimes I use the word bully because people relate more to that. That's that critical. I know what's right for you. Um, I can make you do this. I'm better than you. So there's very much that superior position um, blames other people and just lays down the law and says, this is what's got to happen. So inevitably, there are three places in a game, but two people play a game. And the drama comes when we switch roles. So maybe let me just do a quick rescue a victim game. Or I can remember when my daughter was at school, she would say, oh, I've got to do a project. And I would go, oh, let me go and buy you what you need. No, mom, it's, it's fine. Um, you know, I can think for myself, I'm not quite sure what you need. Yes, but I've got some nice paper and I've got some ideas. And, oh, well, maybe, um, yes, but let me let me do it and we can do this. And then suddenly my daughter who's going, mm -hmm, goes, oh, mom, you always interfere. So can you see? Rescuer, victim, rescuer, victim. Sooner or later, the victim goes, ah, ah just leave me alone. And they jumped to persecutor. And then me as rescuer was going, don't shout at me. Oh, you know, after all that I'm doing to try to help you. So I go to feel like a victim. And then I jump to persecutor. And then she goes to victim. And that's where the, the payoff. Um, Morali, you asked about that kind of why do we keep to the games? This is we get that like negative strokes. TA talks about the um, a, a nasty uh, feeling almost as a negative stroke and negative strokes are better than no strokes so we angle to get into some sort of drama because at least we feel alive so really to, to go and I'm thinking even just two minutes Claire into um, let's uh, in pairs Two minutes in a breakout room, is that even doable? It is. Set it for two minutes and then a, and a minute to, to wind down. So you've actually got three minutes. But um, pairs and just this is kind of, you know, um, tell all to your colleague in, in your breakout room. Because we all play on the drama triangle. So where is your most favorite role? Where do you start? I know I'm quite a kind person. So when I'm feeling stressed or out of my okay okay box I tend to rescue and I do too much and then when it doesn't go right because no none of the roles on the drama triangle go right I then go oh poor me after all the care and the time I took they just blame me I get a victim so get a feel um a, a two minute buzz with with somebody and then we'll come back and we'll add another layer Checking everyone's got some more. I'm some being people. invited to join a breakout room. Is Just that ignore it. I can ignore that. Okay. Yeah. I see I forgot to un-optimize um, for video, so there was a black piece on my slides. Um, I've now... You know, I didn't know whether you were covering up a logo or something, but no. it all seemed like we could see everything. It's a Zoom thing. When you leave it optimized for video, it tends to black out part of the slides. I've disengaged it now. Apologies for that, everyone, who might be listening to the recording as well later. Can we give them, I know it's naughty, but one more minute just because I had to change some people around because some didn't have part. Sure.
but they'll be back in 60 seconds. Yes, thanks. Okay. So I'm trusting you've all um, recognized your familiar position because we've done this all our lives. Sometimes we do it more than others. Um, I saw the note that uh, there was something covering up some of the slides. I, I'm sorry about that. I forgot to um, take off the optimize for video function. And for some reason, it does that in my Zoom. And somebody asked about getting the slides. I'm really happy to um, send them to you, Claire, for, for you to distribute um, at the end. So, okay. All right. Is, does anybody want to say anything about their discussion around their style of playing on the drama triangle before we add the winner's circle to it? All right, I'm taking that as all is all is well. So let's go back to Karen. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Let me come back. How how frequently do you think uh, how frequent do you think it is that people start off in the persecutor's role? Is yeah, that less frequent? I do have a sense, Sharon, that it is less frequent. Maybe because some of us, most of us are kind human beings and we tend to overdo it. But I think people who maybe when they were growing up, um, kindness didn't get them anything and they had to be like really critical and bullying. I think they will start in that bully position and always look for somebody to be less than them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And maybe different cultures have different uh, tendencies. And there's a question in the chat. Uh, is there a gender connection? Well, now that could be really interesting. Um, gosh, I've seen it across genders that people play all the, all the roles. Um, and it might be in certain cultures, a gender uh, in a male gender is more aggressive in some cultures, so might well take up the persecutor role. Remember as well, I mean, in, in psychology with people who've been abused and uh, traumatized tend to internalize that and then it shows out as um, bullying or persecutor roles, but actually it's covering up um, that victim place. And I think there's, Emma, you've asked a question, can you be a rescue and victim at the same time? And I think, you know, everything everything on the drama triangle, it's almost we do do both, We but we overtly show the rescuing tendency, but we're feeling powerless underneath as a victim, but we pop out, oh, let me help you, because then I won't feel so powerless, so absolutely, or, or even vice versa. Someone's saying, I am my worst persecuted and strongest victim. So really interesting. TA's got a, um, um, a framework talking about um, the racket system and rackets. And it's saying that we don't even need another person when we interacting with somebody else that gets into a game, but we can beat ourselves up all on our own. And that's called um, the racket system. So aren't we strange human beings? We do all this 
stuff to ourselves. But a good few years later, after Kaufman's article, um, somebody called AC Choi said, hey, it's not all bad. And even Kaufman said that there's 10% um, good awareness. I actually, yeah, I do want to start here. Um, we can 10% positive intention within each role. So if we in our adult with awareness, we can actually step out of the drama triangle. When we lose adult awareness, we, um, we will be in the drama triangle, but when we step out of it, we'll invite others to do so as well. And this is what um, many people have kept it as a triangle. I really like it as a circle so I can show the flow. So instead of rescuer, we are responsive and caring. So it's okay to be genuinely concerned to help, but it's not doing more than 50% of the work. So we are believing in the other person's ability. So they're very clear boundaries. I will do this, you will do this. Um, instead of being the victim and oh, poor me, it's um, Choi originally spoke about being vulnerable. Um, some people find um, vulnerability, particularly I did a lot of work in the community care workers sector in South Africa during the HIV AIDS pandemic. And um, they were, it was called OVC, Orphans and Vulnerable Children. Many um, young children were literally, you know, the 12 year old was heading up the household. So that vulnerability for community care workers was, it took them straight to these orphaned children. So during that work, we started to add in voicing feelings. So it's, it's okay to say, I'm struggling, I need some help. Um, but Deep down, I believe that somebody I can change and I ask honestly for what I need. And then instead of that bully, powerful, assertive place, it's saying I can be bold and firm about what needs to happen, but there's not um, a nastiness or blame that, that comes about, is I name what can happen. And just because I could, I kind of popped in some arrows here, because I think ideally we meant to be, if I got really fancy, I'd get them shimmering and shaking and moving. Um, we should be able to flow between all the roles. And I'm sure you're starting to see pretty soon where I'm going to go with overlaying it with the OK, OK box. This is the dancing in the box way of being rather than stuck in the, uh, in the corners of the drama triangle. And what, I've got another three minute video. Uh, I, you probably didn't see that because it seemed to be optimized for video even though I unoptimized it. Sorry, people. Um, have a look at this. This is how somebody has used it. It's also a three minute video. Um, and they put the places in slightly different corners of the triangle and they call them slightly different names. So the rescuer, they call the hero. The persecutor they call the villain, and the victim stays the victim. And then they talk about the winner's triangle without no, naming it. They talk about working in presence. But I think it really gives a lovely um, flavor of how this shows out in, in everyday speak. So enjoy this. Are you working from presence or the drama triangle? Brought to you by the Conscious Leadership Group. Find them on the web at www.conscious.is. Conscious leaders know the difference between working from presence and working from the drama triangle. Presence is above the line and drama is below the line. Most leaders and most organizations spend most of their time in the drama triangle. Drama is characterized by blame, wanting to be right, toxic fear and adrenaline. Like good dramas at the movies, all drama has characters that play certain roles. The drama triangle has a hero, a villain and a victim. The job of the hero is to seek temporary relief. The keyword is temporary. The hero is the one who gives a hungry person a fish sandwich rather than teaching them how to fish. The hero doesn't want others or themselves to feel bad, so they say and do things that make the immediate pain go away without facing and dealing with the core issue. When I'm exhausted from overworking, I hero myself by eating and drinking mindlessly or surfing the web, or exercising. When another feels sad, I hero them by saying things like, 
it'll be okay, or I'll do it for you. The hero seeks value by being needed by others. The second role on the drama triangle is the villain. The villain's job is to blame. I can blame myself, others, or blame the group. When I blame myself, I say things like, I shouldn't have eaten that donut, or I should work harder, or I messed up that presentation. When we blame others, we say, it's your fault we didn't get that project done, or you didn't give your best effort. When we blame a group, we say, they messed it up for all of us, or they just don't get it. The final role on the triangle is the role of victim. The victim is at the effect of. Life is happening to them. For the victim, a person, circumstance, or condition is doing something or not doing something that is causing the victim's life to be as it is. I can be at the effect of anything, including my boss, my kids, the weather, my job, the traffic, the economy, my body, and my mood. When I'm in victim, I'm feeling powerless. Every role in the drama triangle is a form of victim consciousness. And in the end, everyone is trying to prove that they are the biggest victim. When people and teams work in presence, the roles change. The victim moves from victim to being the creator. They take responsibility for their lives and stop complaining about what is happening to them. The villain becomes the challenger. Challenges bring healthy pressure to the creator to support them in facing and dealing with their lives in a way that creates a breakthrough. Unlike the villain, they don't blame or criticize. In presence, the hero becomes the coach. The coach doesn't try to fix anyone. They see everyone as fully empowered creators of their own lives and seek to support them in taking responsibility for creating the life they most want. Leaders and teams that learn to play in the creator, coach, or challenger roles of presence find they are more creative, engaged, aligned, and energized. They have more fun and get more things done. So, are you working from presence or the drama triangle? Okay, so just putting some different words to it, I think often brings it, brings it alive. Um, let me now share how they go together and then there'll be a chance to go into your same pairs. So there's that framework of how do we show up? Do we dance in the box with adults awareness in the integrating adults or do we dip outside the box and we've lose touch with our adults awareness so it's pretty um easy to see and we were already having this conversation a little bit earlier that the rescuer is the marshmallowing parent the persecutor is the dominating the victims in one of those negative child modes so drama triangle outside the box but winner's circle inside the box. So winner's circle is saying it's done with presence, with awareness in our adults. It's flowing. It's it's when I when I used to work a lot in person, I would bring a cutout doll. For those of you who are old enough to know those paper dolls, and you could cut out different outfits. And I would show my paper doll saying, with awareness, we can decide to put on our structuring outfit or our nurturing outfit or our cooperative or spontaneous. Um, and that's what we want to do in our work. And that's what sometimes when we show this to clients, they go, now I get it. Instead of being rescuing, I want to be with mindfulness and presence responsive. And then the coaching work is, okay, so... How will that happen? What limiting beliefs might there be that makes you think I'm only okay if I help everybody? Um, it's even somebody spoke about that um, kind of wanting to get um, gratitude from our clients. I'm only a good coach if, if my clients write me all these amazing testimonials. Is that healthy? Is it more about you or is it serving the client? Whereas if you're responsive, you deeply connected to your clients but your partners in the work i'm so reminded particularly in the in the the recent update well not so recent now 2019 update of the icf competencies it's all about coaching is a partnership coaching is a partnership we're in a partnership in the okay okay box 
But when we play out of the box on the drama triangle, um, there's manipulation, the power's um, disjointed. It's just not um, a wholesome way to be. So my thinking is we've got just under half an hour to go back into the same pairs, if we may, Claire, for five minutes now. And the question is, so how does the winner's circle and linking it to the OK, OK box change your thinking about how you might step out of the drama triangle more often? If we take five minutes for that, and then when we come back, we'll use the rest of the time in plenary for deepening the how do we use this in coaching, whatever other questions emerge for you. Thank you, Claire. And we're off. <laughs> I'm back again. I don't know why. <laughs> what have I done wrong, Samira? If people have bounced back. Yes, I was in group uh, one tree okay. and then puff. I'll, I'll do it. Back. Before I could join, I just disappeared. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Ah, voilà. Hey, back again. Just give me a second. I know. Do you want to go in, Britta? Who are you with? I can send you, Britta, to any room. Actually, you are a co-host. You can join any room. Yeah, and you're on mute. You. Yeah. I, I, I was alone in, in uh, room nine before I was in room 11. Yeah, so we I shifted the rooms. I'll send you to a room now. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I, I got kicked out again. Okay. So later, Samira, I need to understand why that's happened because I didn't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. And I notice sometimes in, in larger webinars in the International TA Association, sometimes the rooms do this, certainly in smaller groups. I've never had that issue. So yeah, I also don't understand why it does it. Strange. I think this is a fabulous tool for leadership development as well. Just deepening awareness. And going to D. This is where I'm so curious to get to have been a fly on the wall to go. Oh, I wonder what their conversation was in the mm. in in the pairs. So there's an opportunity now, ten minutes or so, to share a bit of your thinking, to ask any more questions before we start uh, bringing it to an end. So over to you. Got a question? Yeah. Um, we, we were talking about um, change. So if, if we're doing self-development and seeking through greater self-awareness and, uh, and so on to stay more in the adult space, um, that might appear as a change to, for example, our family around us. And it might discombobulate and confuse and destabilize them and and that could maybe result in behaviors that would encourage you to stay where you were and to the, stay in the same familial scripts 
And um, we started ideating about what can one do about that to really stay in the adult space with those temptations to be drawn into the past behaviours. Mm -hmm. And we were wondering whether perhaps, and I'd love to know whether you've got other ideas, we started to wonder whether it makes sense to even just talk to those around us. Oh, look, this is a framework we've discovered and found it really interesting. We're seeking to do this. And what do you think? And, and just maybe have a conversation about it. Brilliant. Emma, and you, you, you're spot on. It's that ecology piece. If we change, what's going to happen around us? And is that what they want and what we want? And, you know, I'm, I was talking before you came back with um, your, your colleagues. Byrne always said, give the patient the power. Remember, he was a doctor, a psychiatrist. So that principle applies. Share the model. Um, it, it really empowers people. And, you know, when people have done the introductory TA days with me, inevitably they say, there was nothing new. It's common sense. But now I understand my life and how I'm reacting. So give them the model, give them the framework. And, you know, one of the other pieces of gold in the TA models is how Bernd spoke about contracting as having three layers. The administrative piece is, okay, what are we going to do when and how much or whatever? The next layer is the roles and responsibilities, who's doing what? And then the most important layer is the psychological level. How do we do the you and me here? And I think if we're undergoing personal awareness and changing, we've got to renegotiate the you and me piece with our family or our colleagues and share some of our insights and what's important for us. And I think if it's important enough in the relationship, people will be open to hear. And if it's not, maybe that's when sometimes relationships will drift apart. If there's too much invested in one party to keep the old patterns going. I hope that gives you some more food for thought. You were already doing lovely thinking. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thinking about um, when there's to do with performance management and there's a line manager mm. who's having coaching because they're finding it difficult to work with one of their team who is, I hate the phrase, but it's out there, consciously incompetent by choice mm -hmm. they can do it but they you know mm. they choose to misbehave mm. um where to go with that one <laughs> you know that's so interesting Claire I know um in situations like that I would dip into another TA framework um Byrne talks about psychological hungers and one of them is for recognition Another one is for structure, like, do I know where I stand in the system? And then another one is for stimulus, new um, challenges. And when people are consciously being otherwise, I always get to think of um, the recognition piece in TA is called strokes, positive strokes, negative strokes. I would think, what's the stroking culture like? If people feel voiceless or not seen, they're going to play up and consciously get into playing games because they don't feel validated and heard so give them more strokes in which, whichever way um, works for the culture strokes aren't just soft fluffy stuff but it's recognition and feedback honestly authentically that that's one of the pieces that I always hold in mind thank you and Britta Britta yes thank you I have a question and passive aggressive and being passive aggressive or so all of this I understand you know I can identify for myself when I'm in the drama um, circle and how to react and so on but my challenge is how do you deal with people when I mean you've just given some advice on like how do you deal with people who are in a like passive aggressive state and where does it sit within the TA model? Sure. So I think um, the the persecutor can either be overtly bullying or also passive aggressive. And there are many more frameworks in TA. I'm thinking of um, person, personality adaptations and working styles and drivers. Um, 
and and um, doors of contact. Uh, passive aggressive often um, they like to be um, approached maybe with some um, behavioral change, but don't ask them too much about their feelings. They just kind of push back at you. So it would be a few frameworks that I would maybe hold in mind to try and make sense of the person, what's actually going on. And to, to remember that they learned this as a mm. little kid. Yeah, it was a way of staying safe. They're mostly um, not aware, right? They're mostly not aware. Yeah, no. I, yeah. thanks for, I actually, uh, sorry, I used the wrong word. I actually meant passive aggressive was one. The other one that I meant was gaslighting. Oh, right, gosh. <laughs> So, wow, where does that, that's also almost, um, I've got to show, um, I'm only safe if I cut you out of this. So I'm not gonna, not gonna own who you say you are and what you've done. I'm gonna pretend it hasn't happened. I think this gets into quite complicated stuff around um, script work, but yeah, interesting question. Thank and you. you need to think a bit more about that, Britta, as well. Thank you for that. Let me, I think quite a few people are needing to go. So um, to, I've got two more slides to show you. One is, um, it's, um, there's a book I was asked to write, uh, part of a series on um, that, um, Routledge uh, has got uh, going, um, and gosh, I've forgotten his name. Um, Wendy Dryden has been um, editing them all, um, and it's came my way to write, and people have found it really, really useful. It's got, the first part of the book is about TA frameworks in their essence, because each chapter only had to be um, a thousand words. And then the second part of the book is practical coaching use. And for those of you who know people in Japan, I'm really excited it's recently been translated into Japanese as well. Um, here, as an author, I can offer um, discount. So there, um, and you will get these screens, there is a, um, the slides, there is a discount, 20% um, discount. And while we're on the 20% discount piece, um, if you're really curious about knowing more TA, um, what we've got is maybe three pieces of a puzzle that have got about 12 or 15 pieces to make the whole picture. Um, I'm very happy to, if you say I was part of this uh, meeting to get 20% discount to join the 101. It's a two day course, it's online with people in different countries usually. So it's a very exciting international flavor you will get an international 101 certificate that um, will get you entry into any further study. And the ICF, I've also aligned it to get you 12 core competencies um, in, in CCEs. There happens to be one this coming weekend. I know that's short notice. But if you're interested, I will absolutely keep that 20% offer um, for any future dates. Uh, be in touch with me and we can talk. Claire, you wanted to have something to add as well. I did just so really you... briefly. Mm. We'd, um, we'd love to know future topics that you'd like for the Coach Me Community Cafe complimentary sessions. That's quite a mouthful. And also, where did you hear about us? So if you put those in the chat, obviously we get the chat and that's really useful for us. And then the final thing is, um, thank you so much, Karen. That two hours has gone like lightning. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, and really appreciate you giving up your time and providing those two special offers for all that attended. So if you want to take your mic off to so join in a round of applause, then please do. Thank you, everyone. I've enjoyed your energy and your questions. I haven't been able to interact with everyone, but lovely. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to spend two hours with 
lovely people from so many places. Very exciting. Wishing and you well. And if your details are on the slide, is it okay for them to contact you if they've got any queries, Karen? Absolutely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Cool. Thank you all for attending. And the next session for the Coach Me Community Cafe is John Leary Joyce, and he'll be talking about Gestalt. And I believe that's the 28th of September. So it'd be nice to see you all. Have a fabulous morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks again, Karen, and we shall see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Such a pleasure. Really great, really Thanks. great session. I'll send the slides, Claire. Fabulous.